this is Barry Jackson. I figured if I uh, talked to, as uh, my guest and I were talking earlier, I figured since I had talked to so many um, prolific and phenomenal bass players and in the business of music, I think it would be, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't make it a point to have my next guest. Here. And this is a gentleman who uh, I don't, I, you know, I, it, I would probably have to do another interview just to ask him who he hasn't played with. Because <laughs> he's played with a little bit of everybody from Luther Vandross, uh, who were someone he collaborated with on, on a lot of different uh, hit songs, and uh, most notably, The Power of Love. Uh, he's played with, uh, I don't know, we'll have to, I have to let him elaborate more on that. This is a gentleman um, who, as far as I'm concerned, after after growing up listening to Larry Graham and, and Alfonso Johnson, so many, this is a, this is a brother that represents uh, probably that next generation of bass players and basically changed the, the way we listen to listen to uh, contemporary jazz and, and, for that matter, traditional jazz. But I want to make it a point to say, say good afternoon, too. Mr. Marcus Miller, how are you today? Barry, what's happening, man? How are you? Uh, well, I got you on the line now, so, <laughs> you know, and of course, every day of, All right. of course, every day above ground is a good day anyway, so. That's right, that's true. You did a, you play more than just bass. You you do some uh, bass clarinet. You still, do, do you still do uh, uh, regular B-flat clarinet as well? Yeah, you know, uh, uh, my dad's a piano player, so first I started on piano, you know, when I was really young, and then I switched over to clarinet, uh, and then uh, saxophone, and then the bass guitar, uh, and then a little bit of drums. But I never gave up any of the instruments that I started, you know, I just... Uh, I just kind of kept held on to them, and I play them from time to time. The bass is my main instrument, but I play keyboards right. and uh, the clarinet, the bass clarinet, and uh, the sax and the piano. But um, now you were doing a lot of gigging, even um, you know, like in your early teenage years, weren't you? Pretty much in demand. I, uh, I I'm born and raised in New York, so there's a lot of opportunities. You know, even when I was in high school, I was starting to get gigs. I think the big, the first big gig I got was with a flute player named Bobby Humphrey. Okay. And uh, she was pretty popular in the late '70s. Oh yeah, and she I was she, she I was probably 15 or 16. Yeah, she did. Yeah, she she did a couple of couple of albums. Huh? I, th- I think my listeners are sort of familiar with her, and um, yeah, and um, and so that was and that was. Uh, a lot of that music was produced by the uh, Mazel Brothers, wasn't it? Yep, exactly. Mazel Brothers did stuff, and then um, later on, Ralph McDonald uh, produced her, her records, too. Okay. And you did, did uh, a lot of collaborations with uh, David Sanborn as well. Yes. Uh, probably when I was about 18 and 19, I started playing with David Sanborn. I met him in the in the band of Saturday Night Live. We were both in the band in the late 70s when uh, Eddie Murphy was first starting out. Okay. And... Uh, we David Sambo and I developed a really good relationship where I was writing a lot of music for him and producing his album for for a long time. Uh, now, out of those experiences, what did you? We hadn't begun to really talk about what schools you went, you attended, and what have you. But it's, but for, from a professional standpoint, what did you get from those experiences with people like a Sanborn or um, uh, doing those things with the Mazel Brothers that that you were able to incorporate into uh, being. Marcus Miller. Well, the, the main thing I realized is that um, you got a whole lot of great musicians, you know, thousands of them, but there's only a few musicians who you recognize their sound right away. And that seemed, when I was observing them, that seemed to be what set them apart. David Sample and his sound was so distinctive that he played three notes and you knew who it was. And it was the same with uh, Luca Vandross, singer I met uh, at the, around the same time, and Roberta Flack, who I was doing gigs with. All these, all these musicians had really distinct sounds. And so I, the, on my bass, tried to work to develop a distinctive sound of my own. Um, now, you got, and you hooked up with Miles Davis. Did you did you record with him first, or did you just tour with him first? Uh, the first time he called me, uh, I was 21, and it was for a recording session. He said, can you be at Columbia Studios in, in a couple of hours? And so I ran over to the studios with Miles Davis. I was pretty excited. And um, and uh, the first thing we did was record some music together. So, you know, he asked me to be in his band and to do a tour a couple of months after that. Now, and, you know, I've talked to a lot of people who played with Miles and, um, you know, but tell me, you know, what you took away from that experience uh, that you've been able to use throughout your career. Well, uh, like I was saying before, first of all, he had a really distinctive sound. The way he played, he always knew it was Miles. So that reinforced that lesson that I've been learning. Uh, and uh, also, um, he wasn't afraid to change. You know, he was always something new and it really kept his music fresh his music never got stale and people never really got tired of him because he was ahead of them he was always kind of showing them uh, a new direction so uh, i really was influenced by that as well well and 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 the, the, another thing that i continually hear about miles was that he was into uh, space um did he talk with you about that and if so what did he how did he define what he meant by that you talk about space huh he uh he never uh talked about it <laughs> but uh 
it was so obvious when he played that space was so important. You know, every so, musician is different. You know, some musicians, they don't need a lot of space. Like John Coltrane, he had a lot of ideas and they were all kind of uh, up against each other. But with Miles, the way he was, man, was he really left a lot of space for you to kind of understand what he was saying. And I think it made what he was playing really really easy for people to, to get. And, um, you know, I think everybody who played with Miles has been affected by the way he used space. He taught us all how to use space. Now, um, you wrote and produced a lot of the music on the album, too, too? The, the, the one that he, the one that Miles was, uh, got, the, got the Grammy for? Am I right? I um, was in his band for a couple of years uh, as a bass player, and, and then I left. I told him I wanted to develop my writing producing a little more. And I came back to him a couple of years after that as a writer and a producer, and that was uh, the first thing we did together was Tutu, where I wrote most of the music and produced the album with Tommy LaPuma. And um, it was kind of the next step for me in my relationship with Miles. You know, first I was just really a musician in the band, and then uh, the next step was to really have even more of a, a hand in helping him create the music. Now, that was, the, you know, of course, you came of age uh, music during a time that... Uh, you know that, that that Miles had taken it. You know, started using you know more you know electronics. It wasn't all acoustic, of course. Um, and you hear, I hear a lot of uh, so-called purists who want to say, "Well, that wasn't jazz." What's your take on that? Hey, man, you call it what you want. <laughs> yeah, I don't really care. You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> it's like it's music. You know, and if you like it, cool. If you don't like it, then listen to what you like. You know. But with Miles, it was, uh, I think that's who he was, man. He was somebody who wasn't going to stay in the same place. And that was difficult for some people because they love what he did. You know, um, people who love Miles in the 50s love what he did, man. And then he changed in the 60s. And, and then if you love what he's doing in the 60s, then he'll change on you again in the 70s. So he kept changing and pissing people off <laughs> who loved the music that he was doing before. But that was just his nature. And I, and I think uh, he was one of those guys who always stayed true to his nature. Yeah, I know there was a lot of people who, um, you know, like I said, they, I just basically had to run, you know, tell people, look, you know, if you say if you feel that what what Miles or any any of the other, you know, any of the music, musicians were doing was not, I think you need to tell them. Don't tell me because I love it. <laughs> so <laughs> you are you were trying to start that conversation with the wrong person. So um, right. Right. now, what what um. What did you take away from your experience with Luther? Um, he was another guy who stayed true to himself. You know, when he first was trying to get a record deal, uh, they weren't knocking down the doors to sign him because he was a pure singer. And at the time, in the late 70s, early 80s, you know, there was a lot of bands with a lot of kind of flash, like, uh, you know, those big bands like Lakeside and Cameo and Earth, Wind and & Fire, and that was what was happening in R&B at the time. And Luther didn't have any of those gimmicks. And some of the record companies said, look, we'll sign you if you'd be willing to maybe work with a producer and you sound a little bit and make it more flashy. But, you know, he always resisted that, and he stayed he stayed true to his convictions. And uh, eventually he got a record deal, and he proved everyone that he was right, you know, because, uh, you know, his, his music was incredibly successful. And not only was it successful, because it wasn't kind of flashy, it lasted a long time. You know, he had a really long, solid career. So... That's a big lesson. Okay, and um, talk about that bass that you use in particular and uh, your technique. Um, my bass is a, a 1977 Fender Jazz bass. Uh, I've been playing it since then, since 1977. And, uh, you know, when I was coming up, there was only like three basses available. You know, uh, there was a Fender, there was um, a Gibson, and there was a Rickenbacker. And you had to choose between those three. Nowadays, they got like, you know, hundreds of basses that kids can choose from, which makes it a little bit more difficult. But the reason I cho chose the Fender is because it was um, a very versatile bass, and I was playing a lot of different styles of music. I wasn't just playing one kind. I, I you know, as a teenager, I was playing jazz, and then I was playing funk and African music. Uh, I was playing Caribbean music because in New York, all that is available to you, you know, salsa music. So I needed a bass that could help me do everything. Some basses just sound good in one style of music. I chose a jazz bass, and, you know, I didn't really feel a need to change. I really wanted to grow one instrument and try to develop uh, a signature sound on one instrument. So I kind of... Hello, still there? Can you hear me? Okay, yeah, yep. go ahead. Um, I, um, now I want to ask you about a couple of albums, because you, now, I definitely can't, you know, we're not, we don't have no time for us to talk about every, the concept that, that behind every single album you've done, but I, uh, talk to you a little, I'm going to ask you a little bit about the last couple of that you've been involved with. One of them, um, is, I believe is, uh, the, the SMV. Oh, yeah, yeah. Victor and, and Stanley, um, and I did SMV. Victor and I got asked to present Stanley with a, a Lifetime Achievement Award at a base convention, mm -hmm. uh, in 2007. And so we, we made a couple of speeches about Stanley, how important he was to both of us in our development. And then we jammed together and, uh, we had so much fun jamming. We said, you know, we need to do this for real. So we, uh, 
formed a little trio with three bass players. We got a drummer and a keyboard player to round out the group, and we made a CD and did a couple of tours. Had a really nice time. And um, let's talk about that night in Monte Carlo. Um, I was uh, asked to play at the, the Monaco Jazz Festival, which is in the south of France, and the director of the festival said, you know what, uh, uh, I think I can hook up a collaboration between you and the Monaco Philharmonic Orchestra if you'd be interested. So I said, yeah, I'd be interested. He said, okay, well, consider it. I went and wrote some arrangements of you know music that I had been playing in my career that I thought would sound good with an orchestra. And uh, we did one concert at the Opera House in Monaco for the Monaco Jazz Festival. And somebody recorded it. Supposed to be recorded, but, you know, some said, hey, you know, uh, I think the sound man said just to, in case I'm going to record it. And we were so glad he did because it, it was so nice that uh, I ended up mixing it and putting out a CD. And it's, it's doing really well now. I'm really, uh, really happy about it because it was such a natural, natural thing. Well, yeah, and, and it's obvious. I mean, um, what what was, you know, tell me about that. Just, you know, uh, the, the relationship you had with that orchestra. You, you, it really wasn't that difficult to get them to understand the concept behind what you wanted to do, was it? Yeah, sometimes with orchestras, you know, there's a lot of lot of translating that you have to do, even if you all speak the same language. You know, there's a lot of musical translating that you have to do um, because sometimes the classical mentality is different from the jazz or contemporary mentality. But the Monaco Orchestra, I mean, there's a lot of young people in the group, and they are very hip to what I was trying to do. And uh, we only had three days of rehearsal, but by the second day, we were all very good friends. And it, so it was a really different experience for me with an orchestra. It's very, very nice. That I've, I've read a lot of... Uh, uh notes of you know from different magazines you know doing it giving their own little critique i mean they, they, it's well spoken of um but i want to ask you now do you um get a chance to do any teaching workshop clinics um whatever yeah from time to time when i'm in different towns i'll take some time out to do a, a, a clinic or you know what they call them a master class sometimes they call them mm -hmm. matter of fact next week i'm going to memphis to do a base clinic uh that's tied in with the Stax Museum. Kirk Whalen, the great saxophonist, is, is the head of the Stax Museum, and he asked me to come out and do something with the kids, with the young musicians there. So I'm looking forward to doing that. So I do little things like that all over the place. So you've uh, so you've been you've done the base camp that Victor Wooten has, now. Yeah, I showed up once at the base camp. Victor had a really nice time there, and uh, I've done a bunch of clinics. Uh, Fender, you know, where I show up, and uh, it's kind of a Fender organized event, but uh, I'll play a few songs and answer questions. Mm -hmm. I kind of enjoyed doing it. I didn't think I would, <laughs> but uh, once I got into it. I I really enjoyed it. Well, um, so what's on the horizon? I mean, how do you how do you uh, how do you, how do you top the things that you've done thus far? Uh, you know, what are you what are you looking at getting getting done uh, uh, in the near near or, or distant future? I'm in the studio now, working on some new sounds, man. You know, figure out what the next step is, experimenting with different things. You know, it's a really nice time, man. It's just anything is possible, so I'm just enjoying this this little period right here. Okay, and then my last question is, when are you coming to Kansas City to perform for us, man? Man, I'm hoping I'm going to be there probably like the next few months. Okay. I'm going to do I'm going to do a, a gig with a great trio. It was a uh, Duke David Sanborn and myself. Oh boy, so I'm really excited about that. Oh, and boy. hopefully we'll be we'll be coming through y'all y'all town. So looking forward to that. Well, I'm, yeah, I'll definitely be looking forward to that. George has, George has come here and, and, and literally turned the place out. Now, you've been here before, though, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, I've been to Kansas City. Okay. But I haven't been there in a few years, so I'm looking forward to getting back. Yeah, well, yeah, we're, we're about due. You're about due. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was really a pleasure just having a chance to sit back and chat with you. And, uh, you know, again, like I said, I, it, it wouldn't have been right for me to not try to contact you and, and welcome you onto the show uh, after having had so many other iconic uh, bass players. And how do you leave Marcus Miller out? That's that's insane. So, um, and, you know, we just thank you for taking that interest in that bass and developing it into a professional career and, and, uh, and you know, and, and letting us get a chance to peep in on what you like to do. So, um, Thank you, man. I appreciate it. You know, so... Uh, continued success with uh, with everything you're doing, including the uh, the album uh, uh, Night in Monte Carlo. And, Thank uh, you very much, man. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you here. All right, see you soon. All right, take care. All right, take care. Bye bye. bye.
Everybody wants to see where the next move's gonna be made, so we listen, we watch the news, the tunes, the gaga, the report, the seaport, the speed song, clothes she wears. What clues can we shuffle through to keep from drowning too much, man? Nothing's gonna be new to you, but soon from behind on the latest lawsuit to cover all bases. Cause the New York Yankees make me, sank me. Coldplay tells me what to do. I'm thinking for yourself. But if they don't, they won't, they don't, they won't, they can't. You can't see where you're standing in the crowd, but you really can't see where you're walking in the world, baby. Walk, man, walk. See where you run by yourself, yourself. Walk, man, walk, and see where you run by yourself, yourself. <laughs> 